Uh, the next speaker, speaker is uh, Jörg Imberger, and I think I'm correct when I say I first met Jörg in Berkeley uh, in probably 77. I, John Miles brought me to Scripps uh, to do experimental work on uh, non -linear, long nonlinear waves uh, that would apply to both surface and internal waves. And uh, when I arrived, John thought that one of the facilities they had at Berkeley uh, might be good to do the experiments. And so I visited Berkeley and met, met York, um, who had um, well, his PhD in the, in the States. I think you spent some time at Caltech as a postdoc. Yeah, and then I think you were an assistant professor at uh, Berkeley yeah. back in 77. <coughs> and uh, that's when I first met Jorg. Um, he, uh, he returned to Australia, I think, shortly afterwards, uh, to Western Australia, and uh, developed you know, one of the leading uh, laboratories on water resources. <coughs> and in the course of doing that, became probably the leading physical endologist in the world. I don't think that's stretching things at all. Uh, he's, he's won a numerous awards uh, and honors for his work. Um, and he is uh, currently splitting his time between various places, including uh, the University of Miami. So, York. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here because I haven't seen a lot of people for many, many years. But I come from Australia, which has a very strange sense of humor. I'll just give you a couple of examples. I was walking down the, to the beach the other day, and some guy looked up and said, oh, here's the resident cripple, you know, meaning me. And I knew it was my friend. When I had my knee operation, I called this other Australian, and I knew he was still Australian. And I said, I'm getting my knee operated. And he said, yeah, well, when you're, when you're in hospital, get the brain changed as well. <laughs> so... Really nice to see you again, Ken. Uh, I'm going to change tack a little bit. I'll give you some science. Uh, sorry, that's my wife. <laughs> Get onto the talk, I think. And my cat. Um, you can look at look at the website. Sorry, it's a bit awkward here. You can find the talk on the website, but I'm not going to give it off the web because that's the website because uh, the server is having problems in Australia. So you just go to presentations, you click on presentations up there, and then you come up with a bunch of people. I can do that actually. That still works. And then you come up with these pictures. Yes, you need a fairly fast connection, but I'll see for that. I'll go off my computer. <clears throat> and then the menu is down here. If you go to, to uh, chapter one, the menu, if you leave your cursor over the picture, the picture stays. If you, they're all the same. The talks. If you click on there, you go forward or backwards. It, all the talks are split into pages and chapters, and you can see the chapter here in this particular talk is one: fundamentals of the periodicity. About ten years ago, I thought I'd look at a little bit of climate change and what everybody's talking about and where all the money's going. And I was a bit surprised, you know, I thought the fundamental question to ask would be what's, why, what determines the periodicity, the 100,000 years? And, you know, maybe there is a paper around. I'd love to hear it if you know it. I didn't find a single paper that really has. He, Gildo was close. Everybody talked about CO2 and all this sort of stuff. Well, I'll show you today. I'm writing a paper at the moment. It's half finished. Why that periodicity is. Then from there, I really quickly discovered global warming has nothing to do with technical issues. It's about people. So I'll tell you a bit about the human, human tribal customs. Then we'll go on to an example in Western Australia, just because I know that place very well. I'll show you the negative things about our societies and the positive things. The next chapter is the positive things. And I finish up with learning to overcome our tribal inheritance. So it's a little bit of a departure from straight technical thing. 
I have lots of pictures in my talks. They're my own photographs. <coughs> you can go and look at the images and buy them if you want to. It's a bit of an ad. <laughs> so, if you have a graduate student or an undergraduate student, you're teaching a course, you look in the sky and you see this cloud. You should ask them, how much energy is in this cloud? You know, they'll probably say, oh, I don't know. It's actually two or three Hiroshima bombs. It's an enormous amount of energy. And what's happening with global warming is there's more humidity, so the bombs are getting more frequent and bigger. So, let's put ourselves into context and see how insignificant we are as human structure. Because, you know, the other day I bumped into somebody and they said, well, what's the problem if we go extinct? Well, lots of species go extinct. What's the problem? So, we're looking back. These are millions of years. This is temperature. And and so on. And then here I've just put a little bit of uh, CO2 and you can see the temperature was about 14 degrees warmer 60, 000, 60 million years ago and it went down, kind of stabilized. And then here it started to develop these oscillations at a 41,000 year period and now it's 100,000 years and the scale's of course changing from log scale. Uh, and now it's, you can, I can get you lots of people who will say we're entering an ice age and I can get you lots of people who say we're going to global warming. So, and if you talk to business people, depending on what the money proposition is, that's the position they will have. So if you want to go forward, you just click on this image here. So the last sort of four or five ice ages were very regular. The yellow is the temperature, the red is the sea level. And, oh shit, I keep forgetting to put my point in there. And the, uh, the other one was the uh, CO2. And obviously God was a metric because <coughs> temperature goes up and down by about 10 degrees, sea level goes up about 10 meter, 100 meters, and CO2 <coughs> goes up and down by about 100 parts per million. There is nothing in the data that I can find that CO2 is leading the temperature. So the first bit of suspicion is that this had nothing to do with CO2. So what determines this 100,000 period? Well, when I was at Caltech, uh, after being in the math department in Berkeley, I did the long box problem. In other words, look at the flow when one side is cool and the other side is warm, and the box is very sh uh, shallow compared with long, million met meters, 4,000 meters. So it's so shallow. Let's forget about a uh, rotation. Let's forget about everything except heating at one end, cooling at the other end. Well, if you do that, and you need to have ice in this thing, because obviously the equator is no, it is ice, and ice reflects the heat. So really, you get a bit more ice, the Earth gets colder. You should have more ice, more ice, more ice. We should all be covered in ice. Why are we not covered in ice? Because ice is made of water, and the water comes from the equator. So as it gets the colder, the evaporation stops. So I just set up a simple heat budget for that system. The heat coming in at the equator, heat leaving, and you get more heat leaving when, or reflecting when there's ice. Wrote down the equation of heat for the uh, long box. And lo and behold, I won't go into technical details because the talk is getting too long. I get a periodicity of 100,000 years. No CO2, nothing. Just the fact that when ice approaches the equator, you get more reflection. And, but as it gets colder, you have less water to make ice, and it has a problem. So, period is about 100,000 years. It's a little bit too far south, the, the oscillations, but it's a simple oscillation. And the other big fault about this, it's symmetric. So, and the third thing is, well, what's driving this thing? Well, what's driving it is the Marankovich cycles. And you'll see I mapped it with red dots and yellow dots. So the equation for the interglacial period is really a simple oscillator forced by the period 100,000 years, 50 years, 50,000 years, and 25,000 years, the 25 years. Not perfect, but if you do a spectrum, it doesn't look too bad. So really that explains the interglacial periodicity. So now you can add some CO2. 
because, and I'm just in the process, so well, first look, look at the asymmetry. I'm not fully finished with this paper yet, so it's a hobby, so it's not my main line. Um, why is it so, ins what's going on with this? Why is it so unsymmetric? Un un why does it heat up much faster than it cools? Well, this model explains that because when you're heating, <coughs> and that's why I was so interested in Alexis' talk with the ice, uh, with the salt getting saltier. When it's heating, only the top part of the ocean takes part in this whole heating business. When it's cooling, it convects underneath in the whole ocean. So if you just say for heating at only, only 400 meters, <coughs> the ocean takes part, instead of 4,000, you get a period of going up to heating of 20,000, cooling 80,000. So it's a very simple explanation. Okay. Please uh, stop me if you have any questions. Then the CO2. Now, you know, I get so many business people coming up to me and say, oh, York, it's bullshit, you know, and global warming is just... Uh... <coughs> but then the politicians, everything that is bad in their life is due to global warming, so it's the devil. So it's almost a religion now. And they're right in some sense. It's not the CO2 that's causing the problem, it's the water vapor. So you get a little bit of an increase in CO2, causes about one watt per square meter change, causes more evaporation, changes humidity, the greenhouse gas is the water vapor in the atmosphere. So I'm just feeding that in at the moment. Plus, I'm feeding in these feedback mechanisms. I think that's the next slide. I, this is all very common knowledge to all of you. As the ocean warms, the solubility decreases, you vent CO2 in the atmosphere, you get more greenhouse. The ice caps retreat, more organic matter, and this is a really big issue now. The Arctic is emitting almost as much as the <coughs> total anthropogenic input. On the negative side, primary production in the ocean and land increases, so you have less greenhouse gas emissions. Primary production in the ocean, <coughs> land increases less, so it's twice the... And then, so the ice cores show that 100 parts per million in this periodicity of CO2 changes associated with about a 12 degree change. Two degrees of which come from CO2 change and 10 degrees come from the ice cover change from the model. So it's sort of a nice thing. So now, if you look at anthropogenic inputs, that's another 100 parts per million. <coughs> so you can sort of fairly positively say that a rise of greenhouse gas emission of 100 parts per million will lead to another two degree rise in temperature. Now, the water level change that I'm getting is more like eight meters without the CO2. So I have to put the CO2 feedback in and all those things and, and the model will come out. So if you watch the literature, hopefully in a year's time, you'll see something. So I was pretty pleased with myself. And if I summarize this, I'll do that in a second for you. I was a bit surprised that it doesn't explain a lot of things. So I went to Western Australia. Just to remind you all, I mean, you're all, this is sort of more for undergraduates. How does rain fall? Well, you know, the air rises, 20 degrees C, 50 degrees humidity, 7.5 grams of water. It goes to about a kilometer. It releases the heat. Well, when you put a pot on the kettle, you need to put heat in to boil it. When you make it back to water, it explodes. It's a huge <coughs> amount of energy. And then the wind transports that in. Well, where does this rain go? Have you ever done that sort of thought experiment when it's raining and you're sitting out there with your girlfriend or husband or wife or whatever? Where does the rain go? I mean, if you take the rainfall, 10 millimeters, and you know, multiply by a huge area, it's a huge amount of water. It doesn't go deep into the ground because the groundwater is usually very old. It goes into the surface, 20 meters, so forth. And why doesn't it all fill up? Well, because there are these trees, they're pumps. A eucalyptus tree pumps roughly its 20% of its own total weight of water back into the atmosphere every day. A banksia, an Australian banksia, pumps its whole weight 
back in the atmosphere. So they are pumps, but they're also treatment plants, water treatment plants, because they don't pump water back in the atmosphere, they pump vapor in there, it's a distillation plant. So in Brazil, in Russia, and you know, somebody told me the other day, a German forester, that Germany was actually a desert 500 years ago, because they cleared all the forest for charcoal. I mean, they, they didn't know about any of this, so then they replanted the trees and the rain came back. So basically, oh, I think the next slide too is this. This, these trees are the biggest colonialists, more than the British. Sometimes I make a joke, <coughs> so you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> Sorry. So, the water vapor comes in from the ocean, it rains, it goes into this zone, goes back up, gets distilled, goes back clean into the atmosphere. So compare that with our own behavior. We go to the toilet and we, make it, we never clean it up, you know. Now, it also turns out that trees talk to each other. That's the most recent research results that I heard a really inspiring lecture a couple of, years, a couple of weeks ago, actually, a couple of months ago. So they, if a baby tree is here, says to the mother, oh, listen, I need more water, they communicate up, transpire more water. But they don't just put water back in the atmosphere, they also put small carbon particles back, which act as seed particles for the rain. So in Brazil, this goes, they clear the forest in Brazil, in Paraguay and so forth, the rain is reduced. And I'll show you later on, Australia used to be forest, the whole country used to be forest. So these guys have an irrigation system built in. So they actually irrigate where they grow. So if you put the global warming effect together with the land clearing, burning oil, gas, coal returns the carbon back to the atmosphere. That I showed you that first slide where the CO2 went out of the atmosphere. Clearing the vegetation destroys the carbon sequestration engine and the water pumping and cleaning action. Increasing CO2 concentration in the atmosphere globally increases humidity, associated consequences, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Removing the vegetation water pump reduces rain up to 2,000 kilometers. 2,000 kilometers is large. I mean, most continents you can cover with vegetation for 2,000 kilometers at least. So, put all that together, I think this is the next slide. This is, in summary, where we're at. We put into the atmosphere, these are tons of carbon, not tons of CO2. About 10 gigatons of carbon every year. The cycling back and forth between the, the, the ground and, and the ocean and the atmosphere is about 210. <coughs> so what's, what's the problem? 10 is less than 5%. Well, the problem is the difference, the imbalance from one ice age, you know, from warm to cold, is only 0.014. So 10 is very big compared with that. So feedback emissions. We've cleared so much uh, land and stuff like that, so the Earth's got a little bit warmer, the permafrost melted. The permafrost is now putting in an extra 10 gigatons a year. We've destroyed the carbon sequestration engines to the extent of two. We have this Protestant <coughs> ethic in ourselves we like to clean. And the Europeans have been running around cleaning every bloody lake in sight. The Borden said they spent 25 billion euros with treatment plants on every single <coughs> inflow into the Borden Sea. The net effect is that if you include the total balance, you, Germany has doubled its greenhouse gas emissions. I can't get the message through. And then there's a loss of solubility. So what are the consequences of this? Well, sea level is going to go from anywhere, and the one's a little bit high, the lowest estimates seem to be half a meter in 50 years, 100 years, to 10 meters. Florida will be underwater. Like Western Australia, nobody cares because, you know, it's fairly high up. But the whole culture of the country is built on going to the beach. So you won't have that culture any left. So, more extreme events, that's pretty clear. I'll show you some pictures later on. Shifting water resources is enormous. Like, I'll show you that later too. More forest fires, as you can see. This is a big issue. Dengue <coughs> fever and malaria are spreading over the world. As humidity increases, all of Australia will have those diseases. Accelerated land use change, because humans sort of screw up something and then they go to the next place to screw it up. 
And that's okay when the population was small. But now we have global action and global reach is no longer possible. And loss of biodiversity. But look at this. There will be 500 million refugees on our doorstep. Australia, UK and US are responsible for this mess. We have an obligation to take the refugees. Australia is pretty empty. You know where they'll go. So it's a huge problem. So what are we going to do about it? The threat is that the hill over the hill is much as cultural as it is technical. Our tribal behavior is no longer the way to operate in this situation. The world is finite. Previously it was fine. You know, you're like the leader, you follow the leader, you roamed around, there's lots of land, lots of empty space. And anthropologists are now showing that the first tribals, they, they had no competition. When the economy, common, common enemy was to find food, they all collaborated. But now as the population got bigger, they start to compete in agriculture. So just to put this in the context, here is man, about 100 or 200,000 years ago. So you were irrelevant to this whole development. And as this biologist friend said, it's quite, would be quite normal for us to go extinct. And I'll tell you one thing, there are lots of papers coming out now that are showing that we're extinct. We're going to be extinct in something like 30, 40 years. <laughs> Lots of modeling papers, hard scientific papers. I can't find fault with a lot of them. So, let's put it into context. Five million years, four million years, three million years. Apes started to roam around. Each one of these blue light is a climate change interglacial period. Homo sapiens are turning up here. Communication was by instinct. I've been <coughs> trying to understand that better as so I watch my cat. And you know, she knows exactly what the hell I'm going to be doing. And now she's also speaking, not speaking, but I can talk to her. I can say, you want food, or this? Cat responds. So I guess that was the communication. Families, primates from small groups. The tools were like this, about two million years ago. Consumption, met metabolism, met metabolism, and 10 watts roughly. I, I, you know, I can't go into this, uh, this number. I found this on the, on the, in the paper by a Berkeley professor. I must get hold of him, actually. The population was 1 million, 1 million, and the GP, GDP per capita was 20 bucks and 20 bucks. <laughs> uh, the only point I want to make, it stayed constant for 4 million years. So if we go to the next period, from 150,000 <coughs> years to... Uh, we see change beginning. And look at these different cultures. The mental state of the Homo sapiens was sort of up here, God-centered religion started about here, about 12,000 years, Hinduism and so forth. And then the prophets came along. Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam and so forth. The language was just, didn't exist. The first printing press was 1450. I want to make the point how recent all this is. Mobility moved around. The first ship, sailing ships were about here. Tools changed. The wheel was discovered here. Look at the cultures. One, two, three, four, five, six. The population went from 3 million to 200 million. And the GDP per capita went from 100 bucks to 100 bucks, but then quickly to about 700 or 1,000 roughly. So really, we're beginning to have change. People get very excited about the Greeks, you know, the Nazis, and all but they're, they're, they existed in an instant of time in this time scale. And the damage they do is enormous. So the leaders, we follow the leaders. And here is the last <coughs> hundred of years. Look at it. And take some responsibility because scientists and engineers caused this change. And I'll get around to that a little later. So we went from creative loafing to basically administrators of the university. <laughs> we went from communication one bit a second to 200 megabits a second. We went from this sort of car to this sort of car. By car, Americans went around the world 120 times. By air, half a million times. The computer was started here. PC, I remember sort of in... When the first PC came out, I was at Stanford, and 
to send an email message was a major operation, you know, and you were really proud when you had sent it. <laughs> Multi-core computers and so forth. And look at this, communism, capitalism, socialism, rational, and now we're in global feudalism. Population went from 1.7 billion to about 6 point billion. The GDP goes up. So the population is going up, but nowhere near as much as the consumption. So the engineering century, I don't know about you guys, but I used to teach my engineers to be single focused, don't get distracted by side issues. The lawyers call these side issues externalities. And I'll show you the effect of externalities. Just to remind you again where we were. Let's look at these timescales a little closer. Evolution <clears throat> takes about uh, 10,000 generations. And you know, people talk about animals being in threat like the 3,000 tigers left. Well, incest and hereditary problems are going to be enormous, even if we preserve them. <coughs> in 100 years ago, 2015 in the future. I think we can probably engineer some of these things, and that question is a big question for all of you. 100,000 years of Australian bush, <coughs> It's quite evident that to get a full forest re-established is not just to see the trees grow. All the bacteria have to come back, the benthic communities, everything. It takes about a thousand years. <coughs> that hasn't changed much. Agriculture has changed it because genetically modified crops, you can modify this. So I really say a thousand years to maybe a lifetime to one to two years. Changing cultures used to be tens of years. You know, how long did the Nazis last? I mean, you have to call it a culture, you have to call it something. 20 years, 30 years, the damage was enormous. Well, probably five years. Development, 10 years, three years. By development, I mean building a big building or new shopping center. Like that. Changing technology used to be about 50 years, five years, one year. So humanity is heading for ex extinction unless all, we all participate in decisions. Because all of these things have come by some leader, and we have followers, and we just follow the person, and they lead us into where we go. The Chinese, I'll mention that later, have a proverb. If you don't change direction, you'll end up where you're going. It's kind of true. So now compare this thing. This is a modern dredge down to Fremantle. We did a lot of work on this. Huge. The engineer built this. Now compare the next picture that has to compete with this. You know, it's kind of hard. That world hasn't changed. But we now have a global <coughs> reach. A good trader on the stock market, they're actually moving closer to the stock exchange because the electrons take some time to get there. They can move a billion dollars in a millisecond. The U.S. stock market was established in 1896, and know that. What for? To allow the general public to participate in the wealth creation of a company, and uh, give the company some money. To, right? If I give you a billion second and a millisecond, what are you going to do with it? You don't even know you had it. So it's become a casino. But now, in the latest change in the last five years, it's more than a casino. It's a rigged casino because it, the traders are now so big that they're actually manipulating the stock market. So it's an engine to take money from the poor to give it to the rich. Take Italy, for instance, an example. Italy, or Greece, Greece is a better example. The Greeks are bloody lazy, aren't they? That's why they're going crazy, and they're corrupt. It's nonsense. What happened is the Greek industry got together with the Greek government, used taxpayers' money to build stuff that they didn't need, and they siphoned off the money. It's a huge thing. It's happening in every country now. America gave Iraq a whole bunch of money. Who got the money? American big companies. It's the same trend everywhere. So we need to be careful. So let's go to an example of where we get <coughs> some hard data. West Australia. It's actually a very nice situation because Western Australia is a fairly modern society, two and a half million people, long away from influences, and the global companies have come in. 
So when you now elect the government, you may as well elect anybody because he or she doesn't have any say. It's the company directors that phone them up and say, hey, you're going to do this. I have personal experience in all this. So let's go back 140,000 years. There were a whole bunch of different species. The, country was, the whole country was covered with bush and forest. The Aborigines came. Nobody gives them credit for what they did. Instead of using a tractor, they used fire. First, people think that they used them to chase the animals towards it and kill them, but they didn't do that at all. They used fire to change the landscape to make it more accessible to go hunting. Very clever move from people's point of view. So all these animals, they're now shown to go went extinct. The rainfall totally changed. So that's the first thing. It's a very old soil, very old geologically, very old country, so all the nutrients were in the canopy. So when you had a fire, not only did you get rid of all the pumps, but you also got rid of all the nutrients. So this is my carbon <coughs> conscience, so don't accuse me for flying too much. I have 10 hectares of bush, which uh, sequesters about uh, 8 times 10, 80 tons of carbon a year. And look at the flora. It's just fantastic. If I go for a walk for 10 minutes in Western Australia, I see the same number of endemic species if you go for a walk from London to Moscow. You know, it's a wonderful, and every country has its own attribute, but we never look for them. So that's point one. <coughs> and that's just another picture. Here's my walk. Now, when you burn it, you've all seen Aboriginal paintings. That's where they got it from, because the bush looks like that from the top. So, the world's first farmers, using fire instead of a tractor to change the landscape to enhance agriculture. So, you went from this first picture I showed you to this sort of picture. No more pumps left. So the rain doesn't get transported in. So when the first English settlers came, that's what they saw. I won't go through the list of all these plants. But basically it was pretty uh, barren here, a little bit of sort of bush and stuff here, and a bit of forest down here. That was was left after the Aborigines had finished with it. But that wasn't good enough, you know, then the guys with the tractor came. In 1896, they set up a committee <coughs> in Western Australia to import species from England and other places so that nature could be improved. That was the exact words that they used. The first thing they introduced was a fox, a rabbit, and all these sort of things because they like hunting foxes. I mean, it's just, it's really useful for me to go back and look at history of human behavior because I'm an engineer and I'm part of this. You know. So, anyhow, that's what they came along with. And the, the English had a stroke of genius because the uh, Aborigines owned the land. So how do you do this? What do you do? You say, oh, well, the Aborigines are part of the fauna and flora. So the net result is they don't own, own anything, right? You can do whatever you want to do. And here's a case where I've personally <coughs> been involved a lot, the Swan River. In 1800, ecologically functioning river. Now, Australia always had sometimes rain, sometimes no rain. So there were all these sort of billabongs. I'm sure you've heard Crocodile Dundee talk about billabongs. That water stayed in over the summer so that they would provide some continuity for the <coughs> fauna and flora. Fitzgerald partitioned the UK to send some convicts for more labor. I mean, if you go to Australia now, any of these countries, you know, we want more labor, we want more skilled labor, we need to have this. It hasn't changed at all, you know. There's still convicts. China has a billion slaves. You could make a profit with a billion slaves, I'm sure. If you go to the country in China, they earn a dollar a day. Every hotel that I go to around the world has a Filipini maid. You know, they're just slaves. So, in 1897, first size of rising salinity, because the steam engines, they use water, began to have problems. So they saw that clearing the bush had raised the water table, intercepted the salinity, and the water became saline, but didn't do anything about it. Increased runfall, so clearing, you know, when it rained, it really ran off, and of course, they had all built their farmhouses <coughs> right on the edge, the most beautiful place, so the houses got flooded. So what did they do? They called up the governor, 
And they said, hey, you know, it's flooding, fix it. Single-minded engineer was hired, and he said, okay, that's easy to fix. We'll remove all the vegetation in the river, and it'll flow faster. But of course, the net effect was it mobilized the sediments and all the billabongs filled up. And then because of the clearing, it stopped raining anyhow. So what's the problem, you know? By 2008, I have a bit of problem with this because I was the one who announced it as dead. Uh, and unfortunately, after it hit the newspaper, <coughs> some dolphin came and stuck its head out of the river. <laughs> a meter under the water, everything was, oxygen was zero, all the way up the river. And I think it's dead. That's another last point on this issue. There was a C.Y. O'Connor, who was a very famous engineer in the 80, early, late 1800s. <coughs> He also built that pipeline from Perth to Kalgoorlie. But he said we need a bigger harbour, so he went in and cleared the harbour at the mouth, removed the sill. So previously the estuary was fresh water, so it was very easy to mix. So any little bit of wind mixed it all the time, kept the oxygen. So when the salt went in, it became a septic tank. But he didn't know that, of course. So here's a sort of a snapshot of what happened. When the first settlers came, it was about 1880, very slow increase, very, very modest increase. You know, it wasn't until 1940, 1950 that some clearing, and most of the forest looked like this, that was still remaining after the Aborigines. And then very rapidly in the 70s, death by clearing, and this is what we ended up with in a lot of the country, salt infested wetlands because this water table had risen and that's called the boom years. I had a PhD student who conclusively showed the effect on the rainfall. Here the bottom plot is a picture of the ratio of the rainfall at the coast, sorry, inland divided by the rainfall at the coast. So you can see in the 1970s, 60s, 70s, it was a pretty 30% drop almost, which was due to land clearing. Nobody talked about global warming in those days. There's another drop in about 2000, which is due to global warming. So the two effects are now adding up together and feeding back into each other because the tree pumps have gone, the global warming is getting worse and so on. So do you think I could get any politician to listen to this? This is the devil. That's easy. Global warming, a politician can out say, I can't do anything about this. This is America doing this. Or now the Americans say, no, this is the Chinese doing it. This problem we can fix. We can just replant some of the trees in the coastal strip and the rain will come back, just like they did in Germany. But it's almost impossible to convince people. This is what we ended up with. Oops, this, the economists call this an externality. In other words, the engineer had an idea, <coughs> did it, and the net effect is this. Now, sea level rise is another one of these issues. Each dot is a dot of the sea level in Fremantle in Western Australia. This is the global average. So the, and I, this black curve is my curve that I just put in. It's a parabola, best fit. And you can see 20 centimeters, 20 centimeters. So it's not huge. But the 20 centimeters will allow a strong <coughs> winter wind, waves, high tide, high coastal waves and the beach will be eroded. And it'll take a long time to come back. You know the answer I get for this from the head of the Liberal Party in Australia? Oh, no, 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 you're all wrong. No, Fremantle is sinking. And I say, if you've got a house, it doesn't really matter whether you're sinking or whether the sea level is rising. You're still going to get wet. Here is the picture of the effect. It's actually raining 30% more than any record in Western Australia. Right? I mean, it's raining absolutely more. But it's <coughs> raining in these very severe events. This is Bureau of Met, Met Data. These are tropical cyclones or hurricanes. You can see this is the period 1930 to 40. This is, I can't read it, sorry. Uh, 2006, 1986. So 10 years now and 10 years, about 50 years ago. So there's been a huge increase in the severity of these storms. So while you get more rain, it's kind of difficult to utilize this because they had a banana plantation up here, a very big one, 
And when one of those things went right over the banana plant in Carnarvon, it just wiped out the whole banana plantation. So there's a new challenge, and that is to harness this more water. And we're, I'm working on that at the moment. This is some simulations that I picked up from a colleague in the US of dengue fever. There's actually a movie on the web. And malaria. So the red is where malaria is in 2005, the red is where it'll be in 2050. And you can see Western Australia, Perth, all the inhabited areas will be under dengue fever. Uh, sorry, malaria. And, uh, and total, all, many, all of Australia except Tasmania. So move to Tasmania if you don't want to catch <laughs> dengue fever. That's an externality of the engineering technology. And it's going to cost the country a fortune. It's not a deadly disease, but it's a very unpleasant disease, I can tell you. So, what does the country look like now? I urge you all to do this for your own country sometimes. It really was an education to me. It took me a long time. To... Here's a graph from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. The statistic of Australia divided by the statistic of France. France is sort of a typical European country, not politically, but in terms of health and any line that's above this line, Australia is a higher thing. So this one stands out, right? Amphetamine use per capita. This one stands out, rape per capita. This one stands out, assaults per capita. So here we have a place that is beautiful, has eight hours of sunshine, good climate, lots of space. It's one of the most violent societies in the world. The I gave a radio show because they were really worried about branches falling on people's heads and killing them. And it's serious because the education department in Western Australia is knocking over all the trees in the schools because just in case a branch falls on a kid's head. Yeah, I know. So I did some homework. Fifteen people were killed in Australia in the last 50 years, in all of Australia. 1.5 million women were assaulted last year in one year in their home. So it's much safer for the woman to sit under a tree than to sit next to her husband. Much safer. And, you know, if a shark just bites somebody's leg, they go out with a posse and kill the bloody thing. If somebody hits me in a car, I should organize a posse and shoot the guys. It's just all wrong. So what are the opportunities? Look at this. Isn't this just magnificent? This is Red Gate Beach. Where I have a, the place where I have is down there. We have space. This is going to be the most precious resource in the world. Although it's a bit of a funny thing, because I had a Chinese couple come down who was a father, mother or father of a PhD student of mine. And the guy, father didn't like it at all because he couldn't bump into people. <laughs> he needed that feeling of having people close to him. But I think in the end, space is an enormous resource we have. We have one person per square kilometer. Singapore has 8,000 people per square kilometer. So people, if we develop this properly, and this is a more beautiful beach in the world, so that's the first opportunity. I've already talked about endemic biodiversity. You know, if you can walk across from San Francisco to Washington, you'll see quite a lot of animals and so on, but they're not endemic to this place. Go to Switzerland, you'll see a big mountain, some ice on the top, maybe you're lucky to see an edelweiss, some goats. Or something. If you walk from here to here on my property, you're going to probably see 2,000 different flowers, bugs, but you've got to look. You can't be like Tony Maxwell and his wife. They came and, you probably know Tony died, unfortunately. She came and I came and she, they went from 3,000 kilometers over the weekend. They went from Perth to Albany to uh, Esperance up to Wave Rock. And then okay, I got out of the car. Oh, it's all the same. <laughs> we have to look. So we have an opportunity in Australia to teach people about nature. I'm just writing a bunch of articles. Which city? San Francisco, everybody knows in the world what it is. New York is sort of business and stuff like that. London is finance. What is Western Australia? A miniature Singapore? No. We could be the garden city of the world. This is King's Park. If we brought the garden all the way down, it could be legitimately come to a beautiful restaurant, <coughs> see all the different birds and everything, and go home really relaxed, you know? 
the marketing value is enormous. And I've started a group called the Yamadaba Intellectual Group. Now, this is my great aunt, great uncle's house in Jerusalem, because there was a German colonies in Jerusalem. And this man, he was a farmer, underneath the house, it's a museum now, he had three things, four things in the, in the basement. One was a storage area, one was a water tank, one was a heat exchanger, and one was a septic tank. So he was totally carbon and water neutral. So surely if a farmer could do it in, in 1877, we as people can't. The average house in the Europe is about 100 square kilometers. The average house in Australia used to be 150. Now it's 400. The new houses are 400 square meters. I've some, told some of you guys, I live in a street in a very upmarket place. My wife bought it. But we live in a very small house. All the houses in the place were very small 20 years ago. This fellow moved in, all the houses have been cleared, moved in up the road. He knocked over the house, he knocked <coughs> over the plants, he knocked over everything. And then the, the pest man came, sprayed it all because his wife doesn't like creepy crawly things. And then he built a house right to the boundary, which he was allowed because he had money at influence. And I asked him, you know, what the hell did you move here for? Oh, it's a leafy area. <laughs> <laughs> They're part of the population. How do you communicate? You know, that's the challenge engineer that has. So we started the project, and I'm looking for an architectural PhD student to, uh, to develop this new house. Uh, over the last two years, I've designed a self-flushing heated ocean pool, a gateway to nature. I have arthritis, so I, I like the water the same temperature. So we designed a pool together with a bunch of other people the wall here is porous, so you use the wave energy to flush the thing through every six hours. If you drill a hole a kilometer down, the water's 90 degrees, you bring it there. So you can have a pool which doesn't need any mechanical pumps, doesn't need any chlorine, doesn't need anything. Feels like the ocean, but it's nice and calm. And then you put up the banner and you're shark free. <laughs> it's another joke because the probability of you getting hurt in the car going to the beach like a million times higher than getting bitten by a shark. So, but anyhow, this is a nice venture. And in fact, last Friday, we had an old public meeting and got a very positive reception. There are about 20 sites <coughs> along the West Australian coast in the south part where we could build some of these things. And I'm slowly getting some interest in financing, getting people to finance this. So think about there's a nice restaurant here. You go there. Kids, you can take your kids up here to the bush. You can show them florists and so forth. And then you can go for a swim, get exercise, get healthy. The handicapped will have a way through here. The kids will have a way through here. You know, at the moment, handicapped people in wheelchairs, they, don't, they can't enjoy life at all. Totally from personal experience since I was there. I nearly finished camp. Another huge opportunity in Western Australia. I, mean, I won't dwell on this, but just look at this map. This little square here the solar energy coming down, including the factor of the solar energy efficiency, about 35% of best panels now, is equivalent to the whole world's energy needs. Here, the tidal power is 10 times the world's energy needs. Then we have all this geothermal energy. You know, we could actually supply the whole world with existing technology because it's 5,000 <coughs> kilometers an hour at a million volts with carbon neutral energy. So you're not talking about 5% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Let's get rid of greenhouse gas emissions. Come to Western Australia, get your energy there. <laughs> There's the Brazil example. <coughs> As I said briefly before, lakes sequester, oops, I'm nearly sort of done here. Lakes sequester a lot of carbon. So if we put fish into this big lake in Lake Argyle, we could sequester 50% of the anthropogenic emissions from Western Australia and produce 30% of the fish needs. This is a picture for all of you to see. If you walk along the forest, this is what they cut down 150 years ago. This is the tree that grew 150 years ago. The Department of Forestry says a, a forest is mature in 150 years. Jesus, I mean, all they need to look. This is a thousand years old, this tree was. So. We have lots of water, and it's a beautiful place. If you want 
a really good holiday, go to Lake Argyle, ask for Charlie Sharp, the crocodile, then you tell him that <coughs> York sent you, and he'll look after you. If we told all farmers in the world, you can produce bush, food, or biodiversity, and you get value for that, they would produce the right things. So I'll finish off with, I think it's five slides, of what you should take home to your kids and talk about. The first thing is, live as you are part of nature and not the Christian way that you are the custodians of nature. Because people are actually lousy custodians and lousy parents. Before these prophets came along, we were part of nature. Realize opportunities your home is not just yourself. Learn to live with who lives in your house. Ask your children, you know, what the suburb is next door or what the bugs are. Most of them don't know anymore because they don't have the opportunity. Foster diversity, the dangers of multiculturalism. Think of multiculturalism, how selfish that is. Because if we're all the same, then you won't have this beautiful opportunity to have Chinese food anymore somewhere. Because it's going to be all the same everywhere. That's a long talk and I have to finish. Sense of need to others in your home, only people at the end of a smartphone. Remember that. Not your home. <coughs> Developed the country. I was walking along the Sea of Galilee with the Minister of Water Resources. I was shocked. He said to me, York, forget about all your romantic ideas. A developed country is one where you can waste as much as you want, when you want, and how much, or what you want. He's absolutely right. And I'm developing a whole bunch of strategies based on that comment now. That's what people think. If you analyze yourself, I think the same way. If something doesn't work, it's a bloody underdeveloped country. <coughs> Message for America. You can't expect the Chinese to not consume anything if you're, you know, you can't say to the Chinese, this last Paris global warming meeting was a disaster in my eyes. You know? I have to hurry, it's tense getting impatient. You must learn to become better parents. This guy is uh, one week old. He's in my back, they live in my backyard. Uh, you know, we need to look after these people. <coughs> if insects became extinct, the world would collapse. If humans became extinct, the world would flourish. <laughs> Are we headed for extinction? Is that necessary? I don't think it is. But we need to change our behavior. Here's the US consumption per capita. It's the second last slide. Everything's going up like crazy. The GDP, food consumed. Who the hell are we consuming 40% more food than we used to? It's going to our tummies, right? The green line is personal debt. That's very dangerous because you're borrowing off the rich. So you're at their mercy of a few people, you know, and so forth. I'm sorry I have to hurry through this, but the last slide is the most important one. This one here. So, science and engineers. This is what we do, and this is what we cause. We do a good job at doing what we want. We build a telephone, electronic, we allow wealth in equity. You couldn't have a bank operating the way it does without the internet. It would be impossible. We are responsible for that. We're causing mental illness at an incredible rate. The telephone is now causing enormous mental illness. And we're told every day we're not good enough, we don't consume this. Women are the worst affected. They get told every day of the week, every minute of the day, they have to have this, they have to have this, and so forth. It's terrible. It's leading to mental illness. There's a guy in Australia, a doctor, who says relative poverty, calls it relative poverty. If you're all doing the same thing, you don't feel it. But if you constantly get told you're a poor guy, or you don't have big enough boobs, or you don't have this, or you don't have that. I've got, I'm writing a new paper called Guns and Tits. You know? <laughs> the whole world has degenerated into that, and we have to realize it. So, cars efficient, global warming, transportation, loss of cultures, heavy equipment, loss of biodiversity, mental illness, medical procedures. I gave a talk to the College of Surgeons in Australia, and I explained to them that in Australia now, there are more people getting older than 65 than babies born. You guys should stop making us get older. <laughs> Went over like a lead balloon. 
All right, to take our message to last slide, can we curb our temptation to avoid the storm? That's the question. You know, the global warming problem is easily solved. Just for reforest Australia and we can sequester everything. Just use energy from Australia. And I'm sure there are equal opportunities in every country in the world. I've just noticed the best. I'm not saying Australia is special. <clears throat> but we as engineers and scientists, we need to realize that going to the moon, I made a big mistake at Caltech when I was there. There's some guy gave a talk of really excited, the whole audience was excited about going to some Mars probe. And I said, well, why is he doing this? You know? And I was really held down. <laughs> why do you need to know how old the universe is if we can't even look after our own world in the next 10 years? Let's get our priorities straight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for that. here. I think we're going to be thrown out to prepare this room, so... Uh, if you have any questions for York, uh, I'm sure you can catch him between now and the end of the evening. So, If you know any PhD student who would like to work on some of these problems, send them my way.